Hansen, who is working uh, in the transportation services division at the city of Toronto. And today his talk is going to be about King Street as a pilot and other strategies to improve survey human performance in the city of Toronto. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming David. Thank you, and uh, good morning, and very good to see such high turnout. I assume this is because the King Street Transit Pilot is a very public project, and therefore lots of interest in it. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, give you an overview of how it was actually delivered, and how it's actually performing, and how we're monitoring it. And uh, I'll note that all the information in this presentation is public, uh, so really it's just a description of how we actually implemented the project, and maybe it will help you give a, a better, give you a better understanding of uh, where those numbers are coming from that show up in the public data dashboard from the project website each month. So, uh, so I'm David Cooperman, I'm manager of the Surface Transit Projects Group, and I'll note that during this talk, I will speak a little bit about the other initiatives that we have underway at the city to improve transit on other routes. I know that the level of interest is very high for King Street, so that will be the focus of this presentation, but I will speak a little bit about other things that, that we're doing elsewhere in the city as well. So, in this presentation, I'll give an overview of the pilot. I'll also speak about the very comprehensive evaluation and monitoring program that we have underway. So this is something that, when we took the report to council to get approval for this project, uh, we made a commitment to uh, monitor the pilot and to respond with changes if necessary to the design and operations to respond um, to any issues that occurred um, to improve the performance further if we thought uh, there were ways to do so to respond to feedback received during the pilot projects was very much meant as <coughs> a living and changeable project and since it's temporary and the materials we use are temporary it's very easy to make most of those changes and I'll get into a little bit more detail on that as well. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the interim results, uh, what we've seen so far, uh, both again those public uh, figures that you've seen in the news that are on the project website, but also sort of what went into, uh, into compiling and creating those. And I'll talk about, as I mentioned, other efforts that are underway in the city to improve the performance of surface transit elsewhere. So, why was King Street selected? Why King Street and not Queen Street and not some other corridor? Well, there was a lot of uh, reasoning behind it, and primarily it was um, the size of the, the transit route, the ridership was very high. Um, so, when this uh, idea of the King Street Pilot was first envisioned, created, this was 2016 into uh, early 2017 when it was in the sort of conceptual stage, uh, we saw that King Street was a very good candidate because. Um, not only is it a major street that goes through the downtown core and carries a lot of people, 72,000 riders per day in 2017, um, but also uh, there were issues with how the streetcar interacted uh, with other road users, with other functions of the street. So uh, the streetcars were very crowded, service uh, was not very reliable, it was very slow, and uh, we were also noticing that because it was operating in mixed traffic, uh, traffic congestion was a factor in many of those delays, and additionally, uh, with the approximately 20,000 vehicles using uh, the central section of King Street each day, uh, it was not the, the street was not performing very well for those road users either. So uh, all of those were reasons to explore uh, doing something a little bit different. If you look at the bottom of the chart there, uh, you see sort of a map of the corridor and those. Uh, different colors shading parts of the corridor indicate the travel speeds. This is the average speed of the 504 King Street car in, I think this was in 2016. Uh, you can see the deep red is very slow, and in fact, uh, there were blocks of King Street that could be traversed on foot faster than the streetcar. So, the streetcar was actually moving slower than walking speed on average, and obviously, uh, not a lot of people would be willing to pay a transit fare if it doesn't get them faster than they by walking. So that was clearly seen as a problem and something that we wanted to address. And uh, we also wanted to include not only that sort of bad section of very slow service, but also uh, we wanted to make sure that it included major transfer points because there's a lot of ridership that transfers at the subway station, the Young Street, and University Avenue. And um, we're also looking at the road network. and. 
uh, trying to ensure that if we were to do something different on King Street, potentially restrict traffic, uh, that there would be other places for that traffic to go. So we didn't want uh, to make the stretch of King Street too long that we were making changes to because the road network isn't continuous, so there aren't a lot of parallel alternatives uh, if you go west of Bathurst Street or east of Jarvis Street. So that's some of the reasoning behind uh, our selection of King Street and in particular uh, those limits for the project between Bathurst and Jarvis. So I mentioned traffic congestion. It's certainly not the only contributor to delays on the King Street part. Uh, we'll get into a few others, but it is one, certainly. And uh, by showing these pictures, what I'm saying is not that uh, there is traffic congestion on King Street 24 hours a day. That's not the case. Uh, but what became very evident when we were looking at the data was that King Street was unique in that the traffic congestion was occurring not just during traditional peak periods, but also during non-peak periods. So King Street has a lot of activity, uh, pedestrians, traffic, and all kinds of road users, uh, many different hours of the day and days of the week. So not only do you see a lot of traffic in the usual morning and afternoon peak periods on weekdays, but you also see uh, quite a high level of traffic during special events. So this could be sporting events, it could be concerts, those types of things that happen a lot in the area of downtown King Street. And uh, obviously the entertainment district as well, King Street West, further west, um, there's a lot of activity there late at night, on uh, weekend evenings, so actually even Thursday evenings, Fridays, Saturdays, uh, a lot of activity there, a lot of pedestrians, a lot of traffic. So we knew that whatever solution uh, we developed would have to cover not just the traditional peak periods, but some of these other periods as well. So there were a few things that uh, we tried before the pilot. Um, these are things that we have looked at on other corridors as well, and on King Street, King Street was made a priority because we were seeing uh, such high ridership and such slow and unreliable service there. So uh, we tried things like uh, reserved lanes on a time of day basis. So uh, whether you noticed it or not, uh, there were actually reserved streetcar lanes on King Street for many years during peak periods for certain sections. And uh, we found it was that compliance just wasn't very good for those. They weren't very effective. Uh, at prioritizing transit. Also, uh, there is transit signal priority that gives priority to streetcars at many of the intersections along King Street. Uh, we did a review of all the locations and actually found that some of them weren't functioning uh, either at all or uh, to their full potential. So uh, there were many repairs uh, done to TSP uh, by 2016. Additionally, we extended the peak period uh, traffic restrictions. So there was a stopping prohibition and term prohibitions, and we, in 2014, extended those to 7 to 10 in the morning, 3 to 7 in the afternoon. So for longer periods, uh, traffic was moving in the curb lanes, and hopefully that would make a difference for the streetcar as well, in the center lanes. Uh, we also put up some of these signs, as you can see in the photo there, uh, LED blackout signs. So these don't actually change traffic regulations. What they do is that they make them more apparent. So. Uh, Whereas the static signs show the hours during which you're not allowed to turn left, um, they, they may be a bit hard to see and it may not be apparent from a distance. And so for motorists trying to make a decision, that puts them in a position where they might be deciding right at the intersection uh, whether to turn or not, and uh, compliance could be hindered by that lack of understanding. So uh, at key intersections, we put up some of these LED blank signs to make that clearer to prevent left turning traffic from blocking the street first. Um, also, Old reporting, this was on the TTC side, uh, starting in, um, this was also a, a process, getting the whole network, streetcar network, to this new system of proof of payment card collection old reporting. Uh, that happened between 2014 and 2016. And the removal of certain streetcar stops where they were very closely spaced, and that was slowing down service, so that happened as well. And uh, changing uh, the schedule of running times for streetcars, even adding in buses uh, to increase capacity Mostly that had to do with the streetcar shortage while we were waiting for the new streetcars to come in from Bombardier. And uh, even creating a new route, the 514 Charity. So essentially what that did was um, it created an overlay route that served transit passengers on King Street between uh, the Dufferin Loop uh, near Exhibition Place and the Distillery District uh, on uh, Cherry Street. So that essentially created more frequent service and higher capacity on the central section of King Street. So, all these things were done. Uh, they all had a positive effect, uh, but maybe not quite enough. We saw this as 
as a street, as one that really required something bigger, a bigger change that would really make the transit priority for it. So, along with the transit pilot project, uh, there's also a modeling study that's underway. And essentially what this is, is an effort to uh, create a downtown Toronto uh, micro simulation model, uh, which really, which we saw is really necessary. Um, if we're going to make major changes on King Street, uh, those would have potentially significant network impacts. So we need to understand what those were and to manage them. And so the modeling study looks at uh, several scenarios. One of them very closely matches the pilot that we actually have on the ground. Um, and then there are several, several others that look at sort of different levels of intervention, uh, ranging from some of the operational changes I mentioned earlier that have already been undertaken or others along those lines, uh, to something uh, to those that include more significant traffic restrictions. And uh, the idea then through this modeling study is to understand relatively how these scenarios compare to each other. So uh, what do they offer in terms of benefits to transit, in terms of speed, capacity, and reliability, and what are the impacts throughout the network on other road users? And by other road users, I mean uh, not just motorists, although obviously that, that's an important factor, uh, but also uh, how do they impact even pedestrians, for example, because when you look at transit signal priority or changes to signal timing, uh, there are impacts if you offer extensions in one direction to the side street movements and to pedestrians waiting to cross as well. So those are things that we have to consider in anything to do. So importantly, the findings from the pilot project, and they'll be informed by the modeling study as well, uh, will uh, the findings will go to a report into a report that's going to City Council. So we've been asked to report back to City Council. Uh, at this point, it looks like it will happen early next year. And it will include, our report will include recommendations on what to do with King Street in the future. So we'll either recommend uh, extending the pilot and making it permanent or something similar. Uh, or if the data don't support it, uh, we recommend going back to the previous configuration of King Street. So, uh, we are looking through, and I will get into the results uh, coming up here. So, here's just a snapshot. This is what actually a typical stop, uh, streetcar stop, looks like now on King Street. So, you can see that, uh, fortunately, we have one of the newer streetcars there, and those are, for the most part, have replaced the, the older legacy streetcars. Uh, but you can also see the, the setup of the transit stop is a little bit different from how it was before. We moved the stops from the near side of the intersection to the far side after the traffic lights. So uh, far side stop location in the curb lane, which has been repurposed for, the, for that purpose, um, with a decorated concrete barrier, as you can see, uh, to guide turning traffic. Uh, so what that allows is for more direct boarding. So whereas before we had passengers uh, boarding at near side stops and crossing the curb lane of traffic and relying on traffic to stop behind the streetcar uh, to board and uh, alight on the streetcar. Now, with these far side stops, we actually have a waiting platform in that repurposed curb lane right next to the streetcar. So it allows for more direct boarding, which we had hoped would uh, reduce the dwell times and speed up, be another contributor to speeding up the service on King Street. Uh, the answer the results are a little more complicated than that. Uh, so, this was King Street before, um, and this is typical for all the streetcar, uh, major streetcar corridors in Toronto. Uh, so we have uh, a four-lane street with two lanes in each direction. The median lanes are used uh, for streetcar service, they contain the tracks, and then the curb lane is used for traffic movement during peak periods and parking and off-peak periods. So that's what we had on King Street. So. Uh, we had streetcars operating mixed traffic. Uh, all traffic was allowed to make all the usual movements, except for some restrictions on left turns. Uh, but at other intersections and at other period, during other periods of the day, there were in fact left turns blocking streetcars and delaying streetcars. Also, as I mentioned, the transit passengers had to wait on the sidewalk and cross the curb lane toward the streetcar. Uh, importantly, also, uh, while the off-peak parking provided some spaces for loading activities. 
Uh, the fact is, when those parking spaces were actually used by stationary parked cars, they weren't available for loading. So we also saw a need for whatever we did to provide space for those loading activities to happen. So that, that includes passenger loading, uh, just people being picked up and dropped off. Um, it includes uh, taxi service as well. So we added some taxi stands and uh, space for, uh, for goods deliveries as well. So those were allowed in off-peak hours before. One of the changes with the pilot was actually to allow those 24 hours a day. So here's a picture of sort of how um, the general circulation patterns uh, change with the introduction of the pilot. So we developed this concept of local traffic access only. So uh, no longer could King Street be used for most traffic to travel all the way through. Um, however, we did see it as being very important to allow local traffic access. So one of the realities of King Street is that there are buildings on King Street um, and there are destinations that are served through access only on King Street. And so we couldn't take away that access. So if you can imagine um, the financial district, certain other businesses, uh, they might only be able to accept uh, deliveries uh, during uh, or only off King Street. They don't actually have access for a driveway off the side street or a loading dock or other facilities that they use. So it just <laughs> became realistic to eliminate all private vehicle traffic uh, off the street. So local traffic access was very important. And what we created was a series of these right turn loops. So what you can see is that. For most traffic, through movements are not permitted at the majority of signalized intersections. Um, I do say the majority, but they are allowed at some. So essentially there are a few places where private traffic can travel for several blocks uh, through all the intersections and then needs to turn right. There are other places where it's basically every block. So um, there's no through movement in terms of through the entire corridor of Alpers to Jarvis. There are places where traffic can go a few blocks on King Street before turning right. And primarily that's related to uh, intersections that have uh, one-way streets where obviously we couldn't make this happen, or uh, very high pedestrian volume. So there are a lot of pedestrian crossings. Um, there are some intersections where we decided it would actually not help King Street or the network overall to have uh, to basically force traffic to turn right where it's very difficult to do so. So here's what the design looks like. If you go to the project website, you'll see the full corridor map that shows this, but essentially it's no through traffic at most of the intersections, uh, no left turns at any of the signalized intersections off King Street. Movements onto King Street uh, are the same as they were before. We didn't make any changes there. Uh, most intersections require a, a right turn off King Street, and so you can see there's space for uh, the right turning traffic to queue, so a right turn lane on most of the blocks. There's also the far side TTC stops, as I mentioned, uh, taxi stands, um, passenger and commercial loading zones, and we also created uh, something called an accessible loading zone. So, uh, with that, so given that um, people in vehicles who had an accessible parking placard before could actually uh, essentially park or load anywhere on King Street where there was space available before uh, in the off-peak hours. Uh, given that we were taking all of the street parking off King Street, uh, we saw a need to continue to provide something so that accessibility needs were served. So the accessible loading zones can only be used for those vehicles that have an accessible parking placard. Uh, so that includes wheel trans vehicles and their activities. Um, it includes accessible taxis. It includes others who have that permit and that placard. And it's specifically reserved for that. Uh, also, I'll mention that uh, public spaces were created, and I'll get into more detail later. Uh, but those are the green zones indicated there. And also, uh, cyclists are exempt from the restriction on through movements through an intersection. So obviously, streetcars are exempt as well. Uh, the point is to prioritize transit, but we're also allowing cyclists to travel straight through those intersections. And you have to squint a little bit to see it here in this diagram, but uh, you see a couple of people riding bicycles there, and they're actually next to the curb lane uses. So that's really um, a clear space, not a bike lane per se, but a clear space that allows cyclists to travel through the corridor between all of the curb lane uses on their right and the streetcars on the left. So I'll also add that in developing this concept, uh, there were many considerations that we took into account. Uh, we had to really think about this major change. 
and it would be sure to generate a lot of controversy and a lot of very strong opinions. Um, would this actually help transit? And would the impacts be manageable? And what really was the best design solution? How did we come up with those details? So, as I mentioned, local traffic access was very important, so we have to keep that. Uh, we also created the dedicated accessible loading zones and the commercial passenger loading zones. When we looked at data, um, traffic counts that we already had, additional data that we collected even as part of the modeling study, uh, we found that very likely uh, traffic volumes on King Street with this change that we were proposing would decrease by at least 50%. So <clears throat> what we've actually seen is that that decrease has been much higher, so that was a conservative estimate. Uh, we've actually seen a much larger reduction in through traffic, uh, which is certainly what we were hoping for, uh, so that it would facilitate the movements of the streetcar. And <clears throat> so we looked at some of the data there. We looked at also access uh, to parking garages, driveway counts. We collected all of those sorts of numbers, and we found that that it would be helpful to create a certain number of those dedicated loading spaces. And so. So those loading zones that we put on the map there, those were created based on data that we collected, based on loading activity that we were already observing. And we also decided that to really make this work, we couldn't have parked cars in the curb lane of King Street anymore. So we removed all of the street parking from King Street. And I'll add that part of that decision was informed by the fact that we have about 8,000 parking spaces within about a five minute walk of King Street. So, um, we thought that was a reasonable move to make because there were 180 spaces on the street, about 8,000 in the area, um, all of them within a five minute walk, pretty easy to get to. So the King Street pilot doesn't mean that cars are banned on King Street. It also doesn't mean that you can't access businesses or other places by car. What it means is that the access is a little bit different and the parking might be in a different location. So here's another element of the design that became really apparent over the spring and summer. So last winter, we didn't have all of these great things happening in the curb lane, but we did set aside the public realm spaces so that they would be ready for these installations. So over the winter and before this really launched late in the spring, we had the public realm spaces set up, um, knowing that we would have a competition or a design build competition to fill those spaces and to activate the street. So uh, until that happened, they were essentially overflow pedestrian spaces. So where we have narrow sidewalk, in a few places we have sort of an additional space that pedestrians could use. But once that Everyone is King campaign launched in January, we started to get ideas about how to use that space, how to really, really activate those, those spaces on the street. And so we gave businesses on the corridor um, a first choice or the right of first refusal uh, to claim those spaces. And where they had a public realm space in front of their business, they had the opportunity to apply for a permit to get an outdoor cafe. So uh, you see many of those. You see the outdoor cafes and patios all over King Street now. So those are ones that were claimed by the businesses where they saw an advantage to being able to uh, provide table service in that repurposed curb lane. So in other places along the corridor, in other public realm spaces, we have these other art installations, we have seating, we have all kinds of other uses as well. So uh, again, everything here, uh, even though it looks quite impressive, all of these are essentially temporary installations and temporary materials because everything was designed so that we could make changes, we could move things around, we could respond uh, to requests, feedback, any issues that came up while we're collecting data that became apparent. Uh, so all of this is temporary. Um, there is also, but, but some of them are a little less temporary than others. We do have a couple of durable destination park lots. We have uh, bike parking that we've introduced. We've even put bike share stations in some of these public realm spaces. So um, we try to make really efficient and effective use of the space and uh, to really make it uh, usable and improve public realm space. So this is how, um, aside from those public realm spaces, this is how most of the corridor works. You can see the far side streetcar stop there. You can see that's one of the older streetcars. Most of them are the newer ones now. Uh, but essentially, there there is some traffic on King Street, private vehicle traffic, but it's um, essentially only the local traffic, so much the lower volumes than the lower floor. And as I mentioned, the evaluation plan. This is probably the biggest 
data collection and reporting exercise we've ever undertaken at the city for a project, certainly for a pilot project. So uh, whether this raises the bar for future projects and expectations, uh, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, for this project we decided it was very important uh, to, uh, to really showcase the benefits of the project and to really understand the impact. So we decided that we had to have a very comprehensive evaluation program and uh, you can see that while, while this is really a transit first project and we decided that in order for it to be successful we really have to demonstrate benefits to transit first before anything else. Uh, you can see that we're aiming to improve the reliability, the speed and capacity of transit service on King Street. Uh, additionally, that means moving people more efficiently and sort of improving the person capacity overall of King Street. Uh, we also had to do it in a way uh, with regard to safety and accessibility of everyone using King Street. I touched on that earlier. And uh, additionally, making sure that King Street was still a good place to do business. So we have a lot of businesses on King Street, and so economic impact monitoring is a very important part of this program. So you can see on the monthly data dashboards that I'll get into later that we have looked at sales data on King Street and on King Street compared to a control area, and we've gone back and looked at previous uh, periods to see how, how the current pilot performance compares, uh, and that's also a very important part of the evaluation. And then also improving the public space. I talked about that. We've done many things to do that. And uh, additionally, looking at sort of the environmental impact as well. So, uh, in, in fact, U of T is involved in this uh, air quality monitoring exercise right now. So we're trying to understand uh, what does what has the King Street Transit Pilot done for air quality and for noise in the area. Uh, have we seen improvements to those along with all of the other improvements uh, that we've seen on other measures? I'd have to say that we have a very extensive consultation program with the public and with stakeholders on this project. So it was actually the early consultation included two major public meetings. Uh, we actually ran out of space because we had over 400 attendees at Metro Hall at the first meeting. So there was a very high level of interest. We heard a wide range of opinions. Um, all of the feedback we got from, uh, from business improvement areas, from the public, from other major stakeholders, uh, all of that went into developing this concept and this design that we eventually settled on. So a bit about the data collection. So being a bit more specific about this, uh, I could say in a way that the King Street Transit pilot uh, was almost an excuse or a way for us to sneak in a completely new method of data collection into how we do the projects. So uh, King Street was sort of a, a guinea pig, but also it's an opportunity to demonstrate uh, that we can really we can really do data collection and reporting very differently than we have in the past. So whereas the traditional approach uh, has involved a lot of manual data collection, and it's been very uh, very specific for certain projects and certain purposes, and that's why um, often it required a lot of uh, sort of manual labor, people standing at intersections, collecting traffic counts. And a lot of it really uh, was only for a very specific purpose and couldn't be used for other applications. So that's why um, quite often it was a, a throwaway effort or cost. Uh, also, it, it's very limited when you're using those kinds of resources. There's only so much you can do. It's very hard to monitor a very large area. And uh, certainly accuracy concerns with manual data collection uh, and we have faced criticism for all of those reasons um, on the, the data that we produce, on the quantity, on the quality, um, and obviously when it's so resource intensive, it, that's something that's very hard to do. So uh, what we're calling the modern approach here, what we're doing on King Street, is we're really uh, taking advantage of new opportunities, new technologies. Um, so you've probably heard of big data and sort of all the wealth of data that we have out there. Um, that's what we're trying to use right now. We have, we're able to collect and produce almost real-time data that shows what's happening on a road network around the city. And so we've really started to apply that. Um, we're, we're still still trying to figure out exactly what to do with all of the data, but we've uh, really started to apply it on King Street through the monitoring of the pilot. So we've actually um, we've been able to produce, as it says here, pervasive and permanent data feeds. So almost real-time information um, and, and something that we can collect 
not just one time by sending someone out into the field, but in perpetuity. We can keep equipment there uh, through automated methods that uh, produces the data that we need. And, uh, and open source as well. So we're providing public summaries of the data right now. Uh, you'll, you'll see the monthly data dashboards on the project website. And uh, we're also going to be putting all of the data on our open data portal. So uh, there will actually be sort of even more, uh, more detailed information that can be accessed publicly. And uh, additionally, we're, as I mentioned, we're, we're publicly reporting this. Uh, we're, we're in fact expanding measures each month that we're reporting on. And so you'll see compared to the beginning of the pilot, um, as it has progressed, we've actually expanded the number of measures that we're reporting on and expanded the data set that we're actually providing. So what does that actually look like um, in terms of, well, we have streetcar vehicle location data. So there's GPS tracking of all the streetcars. So we basically now know uh, at any moment where are all of the TTC streetcars on and around King Street. You can see their exact locations there. We also, we're also undertaking permanent video-based counting. So we have a series of, you see, 360 degree cameras to give you a very wide uh, perspective on the intersection, everything that's happening in it. So we have MyoVision cameras that are actually set up and using video analytics software, they actually translate all of those images captured into counts. So we actually know, rather than someone standing out there on the corner counting the cars going by, we can actually generate through uh, this the data feed and this video analytics software, uh, counts of many different modes, and not just through traffic, but turning traffic as well. We can see exactly what's happening at each intersection, and we're able to collect and generate uh, a lot more data than we could with the older methods. So it includes, as I mentioned, other road users, so pedestrians, bikes, cars, trucks, transit, and so forth. And uh, these counts are all the time. They're, they're 24 hours, right? We don't have to have someone out there counting the traffic. They're available at all times. And we've, in fact, used the data uh, to even generate uh, and compile um, information on queue lengths, so we know where traffic is coming up in the intersection, and that can inform our decisions, for example, on the King Street Pilot, on how much space do we provide for the right turning traffic, how much, how long is the storage of that right turn lane for each, uh, for each block. And uh, if, if the queues are not long, that gives us the opportunity to either shorten the turn phase for the traffic, or to use that space, or part of the space, for something else. So we could use it for a different curbside purpose, like, uh, like the living zone. Can you see the queues? So, um, so you can see, I don't know if you can tell from the view there, that isn't the focus of the data collection, but I did mention it as something that we could possibly uh, use it for as well. Um, you could see, I don't know if I'd say about 100 meters. Uh, yeah, so, so we're, we're talking about right turn storage of about 30 meters, 50 meters, 80 meters. Um, we're actually able to make decisions on that based on the data we collect through the, uh, the video recordings. Is that data show how many people are actually following the rules? Because it seems like it could. Yeah, so we actually do, we have collected some data. Um, there, there are obviously ways to supplement this that can even improve the quality of the data. And, and in some cases, manual data collection can be very effective to supplement it. But uh, these do provide us with some data on uh, on violations or compliance, so we have an idea of sort of where where people are following the rules and, and where they aren't so much. And uh, we we've definitely had discussions with our partners uh, at the Toronto Police Service about enforcement and where they can target their their offenses. So here's just an idea, just to give you an idea of uh, the extent uh, of the data collection of these cameras that we use for video counts. So you can see the locations. Um, it's not just King Street itself. It is King Street between Bathurst and Jarvis and, and a little bit further, but it's also uh, the north-south streets. It's essentially this uh, core downtown grid that we've covered with cameras. So it provides pretty good coverage, and we have an idea of what's happening not just on King Street, but also on the parallel and on the intersecting streets. And Bluetooth readers as well. So this is another technology we've deployed. So um, also very widespread uh, across the downtown. And these sensors actually allow us to generate travel times. So we've been using, we've been using the data collected from these to actually determine uh, how long is it now taking traffic uh, 
um, to travel parts of the road network parallel to King Street. So this has given us an idea of sort of uh, what is the impact on the broader transportation network. And And then there are other, other types of data we're also collecting. Uh, so that, what I just talked about was kind of the most exciting because it, it takes advantage of the new methods of data collection, the new automated uh, data collection that we're employing. But you know, we're also continuing to look at uh, transit ridership, uh, which we've always looked at before, but now we want to know is it actually growing in response to the pilot or not. Uh, we're also looking at uh, causes of delay, that involves some manual data collection to really understand uh, what is holding up the streetcar. Uh, that's something that could be because of signal-related delay, could be traffic congestion, could be curbside activities like loading, uh, there could be boarding of the streetcars and so forth. Um, also parking and loading and actually just doing a full curbside activity survey, we're doing that as well to really understand are those loading zones being used the way we hope they would be. Um, more counts of pedestrians, we're getting additional mid-block counts to understand how traffic, um, how the pedestrian numbers have changed in response to the pilot. And uh, we're also looking at various safety measures and, as I mentioned, compliance violation rates. So, I won't spend too much time on this because you can actually visit the project website, toronto.ca slash kingstreetpilot, and you can see um, on a roughly monthly basis we provide updates on all of the measures that we're collecting data on. So what you can see is that Ridership has, in fact, gone up. Um, the, the numbers, I think, are actually higher in the latest uh, dashboard, which will be going up very soon publicly. Uh, but overall, uh, all-day ridership has gone up 11% compared to the baseline period last September, September <laughs> the pilot. And you can see during peak periods, uh, it's actually gone up much more. And earlier in the pilot, this wasn't the case. So what we found was that uh, a lot of the ridership grew is actually happening during off-peak periods, and um, at the time, there's really a capacity crunch, and we weren't able to provide the number of streetcars necessary to really grow that capacity provided during the peak period. Now that most of the streetcars have been replaced with new streetcars, which have a larger capacity, um, there, there is that capacity for higher ridership during the peak, and there's definitely been a response, as you can see. In the, um, the morning peak period, we've seen ridership up uh, to 35%. So very significant change. Uh, transit is more reliable now. So uh, the, the number of, the, the frequency of streetcars actually showing up within the expected headway or within four minutes is the measure we use. Uh, that's increased compared to before. And travel times overall have gone down. Uh, so uh, numbers as of May and June, we were seeing about a three minute improvement in the westbound PM peak. And when you look at the 90th percentile figures, uh, so nearly the longest trips, those are down by about four to five minutes. Actually, I think um, four or five minutes is conservative now because we've actually seen an even greater improvement uh, that will be uh, published soon. Uh, but we've also seen that car travel times and volumes um, on the surrounding network haven't changed very much. Uh, there have been some changes, but they're not entirely significant. So the street network has been able uh, to absorb that impact. Pedestrian volumes, uh, obviously when we started in November, they weren't terribly impressive over the winter, uh, but they've definitely picked up since. Same with cycling. And sales, what we've seen is overall a consistent pattern. Uh, we've seen uh, either similar levels of sales on the corridor to before, or a slight growth, and uh, nothing really unexpected. I mean, this is something that's only reported every quarter or so, so we've only had two reports so far. The third one is on its way, but we're monitoring that as well. So here's a, a snapshot also of some of the, the positive impacts on streetcar travel times and reliability. So you can see the, the gray bars indicate sort of that 90% distribution of travel times before the pilot during the baseline, and then the, uh, the blue and pink bars show the data for May and June. So you can see that for, uh, for most periods, so eastbound in the morning was the one exception, although there's been a change to that recently, a positive change. Uh, you can see in the other ones, really, those bars have 
have shrunk. They've really tightened up. So we're getting much more reliable service. So we're no longer getting uh, a huge range of travel times and a lot of trips that take 25 minutes or more. We're actually seeing a much tighter range of those travel times. And additionally, um, the, the more detailed numbers are to the right, but I think really the bar chart gives you a, a very good picture, a very good summary. So here's another way of looking at the data. This is actually, this chart might be even more impressive. So what this indicates is that you can see the dashed black line that shows when the pilot was actually implemented in November. So before, you can see where those travel times were. Again, the very wide ranges of travel times. And then almost as soon as the pilot was implemented, um, you can see the darker bars uh, show a much tighter distribution of travel times uh, compared to the light gray bars in the background. So those are the ones uh, from the previous year, and you can see quite an improvement um, in the reliability there. And in capacity delivered, as I mentioned as well. So um, given that uh, there's less traffic congestion, uh, we've been able to, the TTC has been able to improve the capacity for larger vehicles. Uh, you can see actually a gradual increase in the capacity delivered. So this is the number of passengers per hour per direction uh, that can be handled by the transit service. And you see, you can see that increase is from under 2,000 to uh, actually over 2,500. Um, on, on certain days, depending on conditions, it's actually been significantly higher than that. We've actually seen as high as 2,800 so far. Uh, so that is a, a theoretical, I wouldn't say maximum, I'd say that's a very realistic uh, goal to get our capacity up to that level. And you can see on the district car ridership, as I mentioned, the overall all-day ridership is up, but also, very importantly, uh, during the peak periods, ridership is up even more significantly. Pedestrians at stops is just um, another sort of proxy uh, measure that we use to indicate transit ridership. And the auto travel times, um, I, I will say that this particular data set uh, for May and June, uh, we actually saw uh, some of the highest impacts to traffic. But overall, I would say these impacts are still not significant, but you will see a few cases where uh, Queen Street, I think for example, um, there are a few others where uh, there have been increases to the travel time on parallel corridors. Uh, as far as we can tell, um, since then, things have kind of gone back down to where they were before. So the month of June is problematic for a number of reasons, but uh, one of them is that uh, the volumes, obviously school gets out, people take more vacation, um, so there's sort of potentially increased uh, volumes then toward the, the end of the school year and that time of year, um, and also construction uh, was well underway. So we actually had major road capacity reductions at this time. Uh, so that also could have been contributing to the increased travel times. So um, it's not not directly as, as a result of the King Street pilot, but other things that were going on at the time. So as much as possible, we tried to avoid uh, major, to really run this as an experiment, a controlled experiment, as much as you can in a city this size. Uh, we actually essentially put a moratorium on city construction projects. So uh, no, no construction basically for the duration of the pilot on King Street and certain streets around it. Um, the reality is that there are still construction projects out there, there's still new development happening, there are, uh, there are emergency repairs that need to be done, water main breaks, those kinds of things. So uh, there is still construction that at least temporarily reduces the capacity of King Street and can contribute to longer travel times. But uh, I, I would say this particular month uh, was the one exception. We haven't seen, uh, we generally haven't seen travel time increases like that. Yes? Uh, there was construction on the King Street car line at Girard and Rundy and several other places. So I'm wondering, do you have any data to talk about how that affected capacity or ridership? Yeah, so I, I, I don't. There was a forced transfer between lines and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so the TTC reorganized their service over the summer while that was happening. And uh, obviously, so we're, we're reporting in the data dashboard the full route travel time. We no longer had that because the route was actually split up and changed. Um, so that 
so we don't really have the data there. But in terms of what was actually happening on, in the history of pilot zone, um, we actually saw a very positive impact. The TTC actually found that uh, the way they split up the service uh, actually um, improved the reliability on the downtown section of King Street. And in fact, you'll see in their service changes that are coming up in October, uh, they're essentially making that change permanent. So the Cherry Street car is gone, but uh, but the level of transit service on King Street is not not going down with that. It's actually staying quite high because they have two overlapping branches that serve it. So uh, so so actually that was generally a very positive impact in seeing short long is there any study been done about the perpendicular corridors and how this is affected? So that's or is good. that next? That, that's this slide. So <laughs> north, Thanks, thank you for the introduction. So, so these are the, the north-south streets. So we looked not only at the parallel streets, but also at the intersecting streets. And we found uh, very, very similar findings there. Um, the impact on travel times was a lot uh, significant. And uh, so, again, it reinforces the message that Yes, we obviously have a diversion of some traffic to other routes, but um, it's something that can be handled, can be improved by the overall road network. Have there been any improvements there? Because one would logically think that the pilot would actually help. Can we finish the presentation first and then? Yeah, the there, there will be time for a full Q&A after. Yeah. So we'll get into that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm always so, so in addition to travel times, we're obviously collecting multimodal counts, so we have auto volumes as well. Um, I don't think there are any surprises here. Uh, they're up and down slightly everywhere, obviously down significantly on King, where we're no longer allowing crew traffic. Uh, you can see there have been some increases on some of the other parallel streets, uh, but not, not very significant. And pedestrian volumes as well. So, as I mentioned, when the pilot started, it was in, in the fall and the winter. Uh, those three volumes were fairly low. However, those have increased substantially, as have uh, cyclist volumes. So it's kind of the, the um, by, by time of day, the hour by hour chart on the left shows uh, the pedestrian volumes. And there, there are a few peaks during the day. The UV peak is the highest, but uh, there are others as well. And so we've seen uh, pretty healthy uptake of King Street for pedestrian movement. And, and cycling volumes as well, as I mentioned. So uh, the highest line there is obviously, it's not for King Street, it's for the Richmond Adelaide cycle track. So um, there is a dedicated cycling facility there. We expect cycling volumes to be very high. Uh, King Street, though, has performed quite well uh, additionally. While it doesn't have a bike lane specifically, it does allow cyclist movements. And we've actually heard a fair amount of positive feedback on the new design. And um, many cyclists actually prefer to use King Street because it's direct, it serves their destinations, and uh, they're also no longer cycling next to parked cars or uh, movement cars in the curb lane because of the design changes we've undertaken. Economic point of sale, I talked about this a bit before. Uh, we can see here that the, the trends are basically uh, the level of sales you can see basically in, in the same direction that we've generally seen, the trends are consistent with previous years, with other areas. Uh, we haven't seen anything too surprising that. Uh, I will add that uh, while there has been, there have been questions about how does this impact certain businesses, restaurant industry, and so forth, access has changed. Uh, so uh, to ensure that that access is there and that the pilot is serving the business as well, um, some of the earlier promotions included a parking promotion that allowed, uh, that gave people a discount code that they could use for parking in area parking lots. And it also, um, obviously we, we also had another promotion that directly um, encouraged people to, uh, to use an app actually uh, with the, the food retailers on King Street that gave them a discount there. Uh, but uh, what we haven't yet shown in the economic point of sale data uh, was what happened over the summer. So uh, we have yet to, to put all of those figures out there, but uh, there were other things obviously that happened over the summer. I talked about the public realm spaces. We offered a tour cafe space for the businesses that wanted it, and a lot of new uh, seating and other public spaces along King Street. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see sort of what impact that has had additionally on business on the street. So, 
just to summarize then, uh, King Street Transit Pilot, the design was developed through very extensive consultation, both with the public and the key stakeholders. Uh, our, we made it a transit first project, so the primary objective was to improve the speed of transit and the reliability, uh, but we also didn't want to do that at the expense of uh, a thriving business environment, and uh, we also wanted to take the opportunity to enhance the public realm. And it was implemented in November of last year. Uh, it will continue through the end of this year, of 2018, and then we'll be reporting to Council early in the new year uh, on the, the impacts and the benefits of the project, and that a decision will be made on whether it's uh, extended and made permanent or, um, or, or cancelled and reverted back to the previous condition. So we have made changes, as I mentioned, throughout the project. So signal timings have been adjusted based on shifting traffic patterns that we've observed. Um, we've also moved loading zones around. We've provided public spaces for loading zones in response to feedback, in response to observations we made of how the space was getting used to make it more effective. And uh, we've seen pretty significant improvements both to the travel times and the reliability of transit travel uh, to date, and with, with minimal impacts essentially to the surrounding transportation network. So looking ahead, again, I don't know what the outcome of this will be. Obviously, we're, as I mentioned, we're taking a report to council. We'll see what the, whether there's approval to extend the pilot, what the, that eventual recommendation is. Uh, but we've, um, we've had to figure out sort of, with the increasing ridership, uh, how do we handle that? How do we best accommodate it? Um, and without a major capital project. So we're not talking about, obviously, things like new subway lines. Uh, take a lot of money and a lot of resources to deliver, and they take a lot of time. But that makes them feel suited to near-term uh, improvements. So we, we saw a line that was running at capacity, uh, a very unreliable service. We needed a way to really increase the capacity of the King Street car, and to do it in a fairly fairly quick and, uh, and cheap way. So whereas uh, major capital transit infrastructure projects have budgets, um, not just in the millions, sometimes in the billions. We actually, uh, for King Street, the project budget is 1.5 million dollars, which is, which is very little in comparison, right? So it was all the temporary materials. It was all done, delivered um, in less than a year, and we've been able to achieve significant benefits with that investment. And uh, we, you know, we, as I mentioned, we've done things with the public realm. We've really made it come alive over the summer. So we're giving some thought now to how do we keep that going? How do we uh, make these spaces attractive for use even in the winter. Um, so we're still figuring that out. Um, and then if the, the pilot were to become permanent, uh, how would we actually come up with a permanent design? Would it, how would it look different from what we have on the street today? So as I mentioned, we use temporary materials for everything. So paint, boulders, concrete barriers, um, even the public, public space installations are all using essentially temporary materials. So uh, if we were to make it permanent, what, what does that mean? Well, you know, maybe we would change the transit platform. So right now we, we have ramps that bring passengers down to the roadway level uh, to wait for the streetcar. Uh, that's something we could look into. Maybe there's a design that come up with a permanent platform, maybe a permanent raised platform or some other design. Uh, that obviously requires some additional thought. Uh, the signals as well, we've supplemented the traffic signals with signage that tells people what all the new restrictions are. Um, it's as clear as we could make it, but uh, there is potential maybe to look at uh, changing different types of traffic signals if this becomes permanent. Uh, it might even help with compliance. Uh, it might sort of make uh, the operations a bit easier to understand. So very quickly then, I'm also going to mention, I know all the interest is in King Street, but uh, we are doing other things at the city on other corridors. Uh, there, there are major transit corridors elsewhere in the city. So we've looked at uh, similar uh, not this type of streetcar priority, but we've looked at other operational measures like changing uh, signal timing to improve signal coordination, which improves travel times for general traffic and can also work for uh, transit as well. Um, upgrading transit signal priority, so we're currently doing a review of our signal priority technology and policy and uh, coming up with a new strategy and maybe looking at best practices from elsewhere to see if we can make it more effective. Um, we've extended those period uh, prohibitions, so the stopping 
prohibition, for example, uh, at King Street, but we've also done that on other corridors. So uh, between so 2014 was King Street and part of Queen Street, but then 2015 and 16 uh, into early 17, we also uh, made changes to traffic regulations and we we took away parking for certain periods of the day. We extended the stopping prohibition uh, primarily on the downtown streetcar network. So we did this similar kinds of things on Queen, Dundas, and uh, College Carlton as well, um, including changes to turn prohibitions and um, reserved lanes for transit is something else that we haven't done yet anywhere else, but we will continue to look at um, if it's warranted, if there are places with high ridership. And uh, also just looking at consolidating stops, that's already been done for a lot of the streetcar network. Uh, TTC is also looking at what they can do on the bus uh, network. And Q-Jump lanes, which allow traffic to bypass uh, traffic congestion, or allow transit vehicles to bypass traffic congestion at major intersections. Uh, we have a process to evaluate those requests from the TTC. Uh, we've approved some of them. We are looking to expand and maybe get some more of those constructed in future years. Uh, looking at what we can do with bus bays, either uh, adding them or taking them away, seeing what the, which option is better at different types of intersections for transit vehicles. And uh, obviously we have other other measures we've taken elsewhere. So we have streetcar rights away that we have on Spadina, on St. Clair. Uh, we've done that on, on certain other key corridors. And we have a series of these studies underway, sort of transit operational improvement studies, that are looking corridor-wide at the performance of major bus routes and seeing where are we seeing delays, what can we do to reduce those, how can we make service more reliable. Uh, not necessarily with the kinds of things we've done on King Street, but some of those other measures we talked about, uh, we're looking at all of those. I mentioned Q-Jump lanes, so we are looking at many locations, potential candidate locations, congested intersections, where those may be an option. Uh, obviously, we need to look at other things too because the Q-Jump lane in Toronto is an extended right turn lane that's allowed to be used by buses to bypass traffic. Uh, so what that means is a slight widening of the road. So we need to understand what are the impacts of that. So we're, we're taking away some space from the, from the boulevard, potentially from the sidewalk. Uh, so we have criteria to ensure that those impacts are accessible, uh, that we're still uh, making all these changes with regard to the needs of all of the users. So now I'll open it up to questions, but I'll also ask um, Alan Aberjina, who is my project lead. Uh, obviously, delivering King Street was not easy. We required a massive effort uh, by many different partners and a very large staff team. And uh, Alan was an instrumental part of delivering that work, so I'm happy to join you here for the Q&A. When one of the measures of effectiveness you listed is people throughput, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to that. Right, so one component, we haven't put all those numbers together yet. I, I'm certain that will be part of our final report back to council. But um, I did touch on the capacity increase for transit, and so that was one of the main ways we wanted to move more people through the corridor. We figured the best way to move people uh, faster, more efficiently on King Street is on transit vehicles. And uh, we are seeing an increase in ridership and an increase in capacity on transit that contributes to an overall increase in capacity in the corridor. There is a reduction in traffic, so I'm wondering how do they combine? Yeah, so, uh, so the, that's a very good question. So in the end, we will have to do that, uh, and we'll have to take the final ridership and capacity numbers. For transit, we'll have to add as well the traffic numbers, and we'll have to determine whether King Street is in fact moving more people, more efficiently than most people. Yeah, I have a similar question. So I don't really see in your evaluation uh, ridership, uh, like ridership sources, I mean this additional from 72,000 to 80,000 you're saying now. So where are those coming from? Um, so, yeah. So that's one question. So those are coming from the TTC. Uh, so they do have, so unfortunately, uh, they don't have automated uh, passenger counters yet on all their vehicles. Um, that is being deployed, but it isn't available fleet-wide yet. So those counts are coming from uh, manual counts that they conduct, both standing counts and riding counts. Yeah, but this additional ridership, is it really 
rerouted from other routes, but is it a route shift or mode shift? So, so that's or a good question. Use demand? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, maybe you can touch on that. I think earlier on we also looked at whether um, maybe that theory of maybe these are riders from Queen, we're taking away riders from Queen and they're not interested in Queen. And I think earlier on, in, I'm, I'm not quite sure what model it is, I think we showed ridership of Queen where it hasn't really changed to the level kind of comparing um, year by year to the month. Um, so we thought this could be latent demand or probably not being served by by the performance of King Street Car before the pilot. And we're seeing that maybe these are people who would not be able to get on to the 504. But uh, that's something that we're trying to um, quantify um, as part of a final report. But it's, yes, it's a good observation. We, we actually are monitoring that. So, so I would add that it is very difficult to know exactly yeah. who switched from walking to the streetcar, from driving to the streetcar, from Queen Street to King Street without doing detailed surveys. Um, that is potentially something that will be done in addition to the air quality and noise monitoring work on the project. Uh, so more to come on that. We'll hopefully find out more through those surveys. But what we've seen so far uh, is basically that. We haven't seen a decrease in ridership on Queen Street. We have seen an increase in ridership on King Street. So um, even if some of the Queen Street riders are changing to King Street, uh, they're being replaced by others too. So there is that, it looks like, uh, latent demand being built. Yes? Um, is it a problem that you So it's, those are all very good questions. I think that it's, there were a lot of considerations in the timing of the pilot, in sort of consultation decisions and how it all played out. Uh, certainly, uh, it might have been helpful uh, to have it start at a different time of year, um, but there are so many other things that had to be considered in the timing of the launch. Um, we obviously, it, it takes time to implement something like this, to plan and design it. And uh, for many reasons, it meant that you know, we had to get council approval, we had to work on the design over the summer, and it launched in the fall, in November. Um, so that's kind of just how things turned out. Additionally, um, when I, I mentioned city construction projects, that moratorium on city construction projects, it's very difficult. It, it takes time to be able to implement something like that. So um, that also influenced the timing of the launch. Um, we had to, it's very difficult to get that window to get everyone to agree, okay, we're deferring everything for a year, starting, it ended up being starting in November, right? So um, I'm not sure there's much we could have done about that, but obviously, of course, there are impacts when you launch when the weather is cold, it's different. Um, certainly with the public realm spaces, we couldn't do with them uh, what we did over the summer back when we launched in November. So that's an unfortunate reality. Um, with the stakeholder consultation, uh, we did we did reach out very extensively to many different stakeholders. We work very closely with the business improvement areas that represent the business owners along King Street. Um, it's unfortunately, it's or, or fortunately, there, there's a wide range of opinions from those stakeholders. So it's not like all of the businesses were for it or all of them were against it. We had some who were very supportive and very interested and could really saw this as an opportunity for their business. Uh, we saw others that that were opposed for a very long time to it. Um, it, it was, that, that's definitely on an individual stakeholder case by case basis. Um, so, so we had to manage it overall as best we could. So I think that uh, we've had, fortunately over the summer, with, with some of the improvements to the public spaces, I think that that's helped to gain additional support for the project. But um, ultimately, we will be reporting on, on all of that, right? We'll be reporting on public opinion, on stakeholder feedback, and on all the data that we collect. Yes. Hi. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say thank you for pulling off Transit Magic and uh, getting such an amazing, impactful project off the ground. So, such you know, little money invested into it. It's really amazing. And hopefully, 
the council has the wisdom to act appropriately and accordingly with all the research that you've done. Um, my question is just in layman's terms, how does um, the infrastructure on K and the way it's designed um, compare in terms of capacity and throughput um, and speed with, say, a proper right of way, um, like a light rail right of way on Spadina and St. Clair? Uh, you, I know that they're totally different streets with different widths, but is there a way to compare those two in terms of performance and capacity? Um. I think the simplest comparison we could think of, I could think of now, I think it has even more ridership than Library 4, which is the Shepherd's Station, which is the average one. I think that's the most hilarious comparison, where we've spent this massive amount of infrastructure and funding on a rapid transit compared to this kind of a measly relatively small investment on street car. Oh, oh, there's no doubt, there's no doubt. Yeah. But I, I, I guess I'm asking, like, are the streetcars able to travel as fast uh, on King as it's designed as they can travel on Spadina in a right of way or on St. Clair? So, no, so I think that that's a good point that, first of all, um, the, the ridership is one thing, um, and we did pick this route because it's the busiest surface route in the city and it has more ride, daily ridership than Line 4 Shepherd, uh, which is a very expensive subway line. Um, but uh, if we're comparing to other things that are more similar, like the streetcar rights of way, uh, what the TTC found in general was that uh, there was an improvement with the St. Clair streetcar right of way. Um, similarly with Spadina, there was an improvement in speed and uh, travel time. But uh, the greater benefit is actually to reliability. So, um, if you see how the Spadina and the St. Clair streetcars operate, they're not very high speed lines. Um, the, the thing is, their their movement is it's more reliable. Um, there's less bunching. Uh, it's something that riders can more or less count on um, to get them from one point to another. Um, they haven't seen tremendous increases in speed. Some increases in speed, but not very large. So uh, it's actually very similar. The, the speed of the Spadina streetcar and the speed of the King Street streetcar as it is now um, are actually not that far off. So we've been able to uh, achieve this benefit without actually providing a segregated streetcar right away. Um, yeah, so well um, I I think there is an opportunity. Um uh, what they say? Um we would need really direction from council whether there's appetite to do this uh, project more. I mean that's the very honest take on. Yeah. Um, would it, would it, yeah, make sense it could. Fun? Yeah, it could be an extension of the existing King Street Transit pilot, or it could be a similar application on another street car. Mm -hmm. But we we are not there yet. We're trying to get as many information as possible from the current pilot that we have, and really understand uh, what makes this pilot work. What are the other um, components that do not work as well, and we could we could prepare that recommendation to council. Yeah. So that really is. Um, all we can say right now, one pilot project at a time. Uh, it will have to be a council decision on whether we want, um, well, whether it becomes permanent first of all, and then whether we do anything else similar in the future. Uh, so we have to consider, you know, obviously, as I said, network traffic impacts were a very important consideration uh, for King Street. So there is some diversion of traffic to other streets. What we found was with the changes on King Street, the downtown street network could handle it. Um, if we were to do the same on another street, that's something that we would have to look very closely at. There could be additional impacts, um, so I can't say at this point whether we would do that or not, or how seriously we could look at that. Um, in terms of extending east and west further, which we thought there's some Jarvis and taking that out further, uh, we, we picked those limits because of the available parallel alternatives, uh, because they're continuous between Bathurst and Jarvis. We would no longer have that if we extended it further. Um, so that might actually make it harder for some traffic to divert. Uh, so that's just something we'd have to consider. We're not looking to do that yet, um, but that, those are impacts we'd have to consider. Yeah, so, so traffic has increased a little bit. 
on north-south. That's not very important. But I like your measure of saying, yeah, despite that, we're still moving more people. And that's a very good thing. And I think, do you think that policy, it would be fairly easy to make that claim to council or and to say that let's look at the total number of people that are going through this entire network as a whole. Yeah. Uh, that will certainly form a very important part of this Because this report. is going to be, yeah, this is going to be a Point. We'll, we'll have a new council. Yeah. For the next yeah. council. Yeah. Uh, that would be a very important part of the report. I think this, this think pilot is really a demonstration of, you know, we don't have to move as many vehicles, but we really need to move as many vehicles. Yes. yes. So, a comment on, on the same thing from a perspective. It seems that almost make the claim you get something for nothing. Right? Because usually there's no free lunch, all that sort of thing. You take something away, you're going to pay for it somewhere else. And, uh, and we really get something from Yeah, so the argument would be without a large uh, capital expenditure, without widening any roads, without building new transit lines, uh, we've been able to improve the capacity of the existing network. Yep. I was expecting to see some data on parking. Yeah. Uh, some data and saying, look, they removed this parking off the street and everybody still got parking and this is where they went. That would certainly help the economic argument because most of the businesses are saying, well, how are we going to survive without you know, that classic old argument? Oh, no street parking. We're going to die. You know, so I think some data from that and, the, and obviously the TTC has done a great job of helping you guys out. But I would think the Toronto Parking Authority, yeah, I mean, they have an app. I mean, it, there's got to be a cloud of data on this stuff. Yes, so I, I guess I can answer that with two points. So one, uh, we are, we will actually have data on parking utilization. Uh, that will be an important part of our final report to council. So that is yet to come. You don't see it yet in the data dashboards, but we are collecting that. Um, and additionally, I mentioned the curbside activity surveys. Um, in, addition, in addition to parking, we want to show that in fact, the new loading zones that we provided are being used, right? They're being used for pick up and drop off. They're being used for goods deliveries. Um, we're, we've actually been able to make an improvement there by allowing spaces, dedicated spaces for that 24 hours a day. So yeah, that, that would be our report too. I saw a sign the other day. I remember last time I was here, you talked about how putting taxi stands where, where, where high work. And then I saw a sign the other day that said taxi stand. And I thought that had a slash for the whole that's it's a very interesting question because that's the um, I'm actually managing another group that deals with those projects right now in our organization and yes that was another pilot project that just recently launched uh, these are taxi stands at fire hydrants so uh, we on King Street we roughly doubled the number of taxi stands that we were providing and made them available full time 24 hours a day. Um, additionally, we've been able to create, I think it's 18 spots in front of fire hydrants. So um, again, obviously, if there's an emergency, the fire truck needs access to the hydrant, they can't be used at that moment by taxis, uh, but at all at other times, they've increased the capacity yeah, for, for taxi services. And uh, the Bluetooth and other sensor data that you're collecting and you can grappling with, Will that be open? Will you make that available? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, via the uh, 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 open portal. So we have yeah. the open data portal. Yeah. Uh, so far, everything is just on the data dashboards, but we will actually be putting we will all the data them all into open data. So, that, okay. so, so then, just a related question, because people in the room might be interested, how do you, what would you feel about you know, if there was lots of open data in the room about parking and flows and you know, whatever else that different people in the room could pull together in different ways for different analyses, um, you know, coming up with their own stories. So, yeah. so there's potential there? I mean, yeah. this, in this we, project, we... We understand that risk, uh, yes. It, it's a risk for a benefit, right? Too. So, I mean, 
Yeah, so, so we made a commitment first to council because we said, you know, we're doing something very different. We're changing the way King Street operates. We recognize that they're, you know, we're trying to achieve great impacts. We realize there are great benefits and we realize there will be impacts as well. Uh, so we made a commitment to council to report back on those, to really say, okay, who benefited, who was impacted by this project. And at the same time, uh, we've made the commitment that the data will be public. And so we're putting, up, putting summaries out there monthly, and we're going to make everything available publicly uh, by the end of the project. Really, the overarching message is we will make this as transparent as we can, and we are confident with our analysis of the data. So if there are other analyses available out there, we welcome them. And Okay, maybe final question. Yes, one point. more question, and then we can invite people to approach David. Okay. Very simple question. Will this be online publicly, this particular presentation deck? Yes. Yeah, yeah. presentation deck. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's very simple. So, join me, everyone, in thanking David, and then.